The Monster Maker by W. C. Morrow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Monster Maker by W. C. Morrow. A young man of refined appearance, but evidently suffering great mental distress, presented himself one morning at the residence of a singular old man who was known as a surgeon of remarkable skill. The house was a queer and primitive brick affair, entirely out of date, and tolerable only in the decayed part of the city in which it stood. It was large, gloomy, and dark, and had long corridors and dismal rooms, and it was absurdly large for the small family, man and wife, that occupied it. The house described, the man is portrayed, but not the woman. He could be agreeable on occasion, but, for all that, he was but animated mystery. His wife was weak, wan, reticent, evidently miserable, and possibly living a life of dread or horror, perhaps witness of repulsive things, subject of anxieties, and victim of fear and tyranny. But there is a great deal of guessing in these assumptions. He was about sixty-five years of age, and she about forty. He was lean, tall, and bald, with thin, smooth-shaven face, and very keen eyes, kept always at home, and was slovenly. The man was strong, the woman weak. He dominated, she suffered. Although he was a surgeon of rare skill, his practice was almost nothing, for it was a rare occurrence that the few who knew of his great ability were brave enough to penetrate the gloom of his house, and when they did so it was with deaf ear turned to sundry ghoulish stories that were whispered concerning him. These were, in great part, but exaggerations of his experiments in vivisection. He was devoted to the science of surgery. The young man who presented himself on the morning just mentioned was a handsome fellow, yet of evident weak character and unhealthy temperament, sensitive and easily exalted or depressed. A single glance convinced the surgeon that his visitor was seriously affected in mind for there was never bolder skull-grin of melancholia, fixed and irredeemable. A stranger would not have suspected any occupancy of the house. The street door, old, warped, and blistered by the sun, was locked, and the small, faded green window blinds were closed. The young man rapped at the door. No answer. He rapped again. Still no sign. He examined a slip of paper, glanced at the number on the house, and then, with the impatience of a child, he furiously kicked the door. There were signs of numerous other such kicks. A response came in the shape of a shuffling footstep in the hall, a turning of the rusty key, and a sharp face that peered through a cautious opening in the door. "'Are you the doctor?' asked the young man. "'Yes, yes, come in.' briskly replied the master of the house. The young man entered. The old surgeon closed the door and carefully locked it. This way, he said, advancing to a rickety flight of stairs. The young man followed. The surgeon led the way up the stairs, turned into a narrow, musty-smelling corridor at the left, traversed it, rattling the loose boards under his feet, at the farther end opened a door at the right, and beckoned his visitor to enter. The young man found himself in a pleasant room, furnished in antique fashion and with hard simplicity. "'Sit down,' said the old man, placing a chair so that its occupant should face a window that looked out upon a dead wall about six feet from the house. He threw open the blind, and a pale light entered. He then seated himself near his visitor, and directly facing him, and, with a searching look that had all the power of a microscope, he proceeded to diagnosticate the case. "'Well?' he presently asked. 
the young man shifted uneasily in his seat. I, I have come to see you, he finally stammered, because I'm in trouble. Ah. Yes, you see, I, that is, I have given it up. Ah. There was pity added to sympathy in the ejaculation. That's it, given it up, added the visitor. He took from his pocket a roll of banknotes, and with the utmost deliberation he counted them out upon his knee. Five thousand dollars, he calmly remarked. That is for you. It's all I have, but I presume, I imagine, no, that is not the word. Assume, yes, that's the word. Assume that five thousand, is it really that much? Let me count. He counted again. That five thousand dollars is a sufficient fee for what I want you to do. The surgeon's lips curled pityingly, perhaps disdainfully also. What do you want me to do? he carelessly inquired. The young man rose, looked around with a mysterious air, approached the surgeon, and laid the money across his knee. Then he stooped and whispered two words in the surgeon's ear. These words produced an electric effect. The old man started violently, then, springing to his feet, he caught his visitor angrily and transfixed him with a look that was as sharp as a knife. His eyes flashed, and he opened his mouth to give utterance to some harsh imprecation when he suddenly checked himself. The anger left his face, and only pity remained. He relinquished his grasp, picked up the scattered notes, and, offering them to the visitor, slowly said, I do not want your money. You are simply foolish. You think you are in trouble. Well, you don't know what trouble is. Your only trouble is that you have not a trace of manhood in your nature. You are merely insane. I shall not say pusillanimous. You should surrender yourself to the authorities and be sent to a lunatic asylum for proper treatment. The young man keenly felt the intended insult, and his eyes flashed dangerously. "'You old dog! You insult me thus!' he cried. "'Grand airs these you give yourself! Virtuously indignant, old murderer you! Don't want my money, eh? When a man comes to you himself and wants it done, you fly into a passion and spurn his money, but let an enemy of his come and pay you, and you are only too willing. How many such jobs have you done in this miserable old hole? It is a good thing for you that the police have not run you down and brought spade and shovel with them. Do you know what is said of you? Do you think you have kept your windows so closely shut that no sound has ever penetrated beyond them? Where do you keep your infernal implements? He had worked himself into a high passion. His voice was hoarse, loud and rasping. His eyes, bloodshot, started from their sockets. His whole frame twitched, and his fingers writhed. But he was in the presence of a man infinitely his superior. Two eyes, like those of a snake, burned two holes through him. An overmastering, inflexible presence confronted one weak and passionate. The result came. Sit down, commanded the stern voice of the surgeon. It was the voice of father to child, of master to slave. The fury left the visitor, who, weak and overcome, fell upon a chair. Meanwhile, a peculiar light had appeared in the old surgeon's face, the dawn of a strange idea. A gloomy ray strayed from the fires of the bottomless pit, the baleful light that illumines the way of the enthusiast. The old man remained a moment in profound abstraction, gleams of eager intelligence bursting momentarily through the cloud of somber meditation that covered his face. Then broke the broad light of a deep, impenetrable determination. There was something sinister in it, suggesting the sacrifice of something held sacred. After a struggle, mind had vanished conscience. Taking a piece of paper and a pencil, the surgeon carefully wrote answers to questions, 
which he peremptorily addressed to his visitor, such as his name, age, place of residence, occupation, and the like, and the same inquiries concerning his parents, together with other particular matters. Does anyone know you came to this house? he asked. No. You swear it? Yes. But your prolonged absence will cause alarm and lead to search. I have provided against that. How? By depositing a note in the post as I came along, announcing my intention to drown myself. The river will be dragged. What then? asked the young man, shrugging his shoulders with careless indifference. Rapid undercurrent, you know. A good many are never found. There was a pause. Are you ready? finally asked the surgeon. Perfectly. The answer was cool and determined. The manner of the surgeon, however, showed much perturbation. The pallor that had come into his face at the moment his decision was formed became intense. A nervous tremulousness came over his frame. Above it all shone the light of enthusiasm. Have you a choice in the method? he asked. Yes. Extreme anesthesia. With what agent? The surest and quickest. Do you desire any... any subsequent disposition? No. Only nullification. Simply blowing out, as of a candle in the wind. A puff, then darkness, without a trace. A sense of your own safety may suggest the method. I leave it to you. No delivery to your friends? None whatever. Another pause. Did you say you were quite ready? asked the surgeon. Quite ready. And perfectly willing? Anxious. Then wait a moment. With this request, the old surgeon rose to his feet and stretched himself. Then, with the stealthiness of a cat, he opened the door and peered into the hall, listening intently. There was no sound. He softly closed the door and locked it. Then he closed the window blinds and locked them. This done, he opened a door leading into an adjoining room, which, though it had no window, was lighted by means of a small skylight. The young man watched closely. A strange change had come over him. While his determination had not one whit lessened, a look of great relief came into his face, displacing the haggard, despairing look of a half hour before. Melancholic then, he was ecstatic now. The opening of the second door disclosed a curious sight. In the center of the room, directly under the skylight, was an operating table, such as is used by demonstrators of anatomy. A glass case against the wall held surgical instruments of every kind. Hanging in another case were human skeletons of various sizes. In sealed jars, arranged on shelves, were monstrosities of diverse kinds, preserved in alcohol. There were also, among innumerable other articles scattered about the room, a mannequin, a stuffed cat, a desiccated human heart, plaster casts of various parts of the body, numerous charts, and a large assortment of drugs and chemicals. There was also a lounge which could be opened to form a couch. The surgeon opened it and moved the operating table aside, giving its place to the lounge. Come in, he called to his visitor. The young man obeyed without the least hesitation. Take off your coat. He complied. Lie down on that lounge. In a moment the young man was stretched at full length, eyeing the surgeon. The latter undoubtedly was suffering under great excitement, but he did not waver. His movements were sure and quick. Selecting a bottle containing a liquid, he carefully measured out a certain quantity. While doing this, he asked, Have you ever had any irregularity of the heart? No. The answer was prompt, but it was immediately followed by a quizzical look in the speaker's face. 
I presume, he added, you mean by your question that it might be dangerous to give me a certain drug. Under the circumstances, however, I fail to see any relevancy in your question. This took the surgeon aback, but he hastened to explain that he did not wish to inflict unnecessary pain, and hence his question. He placed the glass on his stand, approached his visitor, and carefully examined his pulse. Wonderful! he exclaimed. Why? It is perfectly normal. Because I am wholly resigned. Indeed, it has been long since I knew such happiness. It is not active, but infinitely sweet. You have no lingering desire to retract? None whatever. The surgeon went to the stand and returned with the draft. Take this, he said kindly. The young man partially raised himself and took the glass in his hand. He did not show the vibration of a single nerve. He drank the liquid, draining the last drop. Then he returned the glass with a smile. Thank you, he said. You are the noblest man that lives. May you always prosper and be happy. You are my benefactor, my liberator. Bless you, bless you. You reach down from your seat with the gods and lift me up into glorious peace and rest. I love you. I love you with all my heart. These words, spoken earnestly in a musical low voice and accompanied with a smile of ineffable tenderness, pierced the old man's heart. A suppressed convulsion swept over him. Intense anguish wrung his vitals. Perspiration trickled down his face. The young man continued to smile. Ah, it does me good, said he. The surgeon, with a strong effort to control himself, sat down upon the edge of the lounge and took his visitor's wrist, counting the pulse. How long will it take? the young man asked. Ten minutes. Two have passed. The voice was hoarse. Ah, only eight minutes more. Delicious, delicious. I feel it coming. What was that? Ah, oh, I understand. Music. Beautiful. Coming, coming. Is that... that... water? Trickling? Dripping? Doctor. Well? Thank you. Thank you. Noble man, my savior, my bena, bena factor, trickling, trickling, dripping, dripping, doctor. Well, doctor. Past hearing, muttered the surgeon. Doctor. And blind. Response was made by a firm grasp of the hand. Doctor. And numb. Doctor. The old man watched and waited. Tripping. Tripping. The last drop had run. There was a sigh and nothing more. The surgeon laid down the hand. The first step. He groaned, rising to his feet, then his whole frame dilated. The first step, the most difficult yet the simplest. A providential delivery into my hands of that for which I have hungered for forty years. No withdrawal now. It is possible because scientific, rational but perilous. If I succeed, if I shall succeed, I will succeed. And after success, what? Yes, what? Publish the plan and the result? The gallows. So long as it shall exist, and I exist, the gallows. That much. But how account for its presence? Ah, that pinch is hard. I must trust to the future. He tore himself from the reverie and started. 
I wonder if she heard or saw anything. With that reflection, he cast a glance upon the form on the lounge and then left the room, locked the door, locked also the door of the outer room, walked down two or three corridors, penetrated to a remote part of the house and rapped at a door. It was opened by his wife. He, by this time, had regained complete mastery over himself. I thought I heard someone in the house just now, he said, but I can find no one. I heard nothing. He was greatly relieved. I did hear someone knock at the door less than an hour ago, she resumed, and I heard you speak, I think. Did he come in? No. The woman glanced at his feet and seemed perplexed. I am almost certain, she said, that I heard footfalls in the house, and yet I see that you are wearing slippers. Oh, I had on my shoes then. That explains it, said the woman, satisfied. I think the sound you heard must have been caused by rats. Ah, that was it, exclaimed the surgeon. Leaving, he closed the door, reopened it, and said, I do not wish to be disturbed today. He said to himself as he went down the hall, All is clear there. He returned to the room in which his visitor lay and made a careful examination. Splendid specimen, he softly exclaimed. Every organ sound, every function perfect. Fine, large frame, well-shaped muscles, strong and sinewy, capable of wonderful development if given opportunity, I have no doubt it can be done. Already I have succeeded with a dog, a task less difficult than this, for in a man the cerebrum overlaps the cerebellum, which is not the case with a dog. This gives a wide range for accident, with but one opportunity in a lifetime. In the cerebrum the intellect and the affections, in the cerebellum the senses and the motor forces, in the medulla oblongata, control of the diaphragm. In these two latter lie all the essentials of simple existence. The cerebrum is merely an adornment. That is to say, reason and the affections are almost purely ornamental. I have already proved it. My dog, with its cerebrum removed, was idiotic, but it retained its physical senses to a certain degree. While thus ruminating, he made careful preparations. He moved the couch, replaced the operating table under the skylight, selected a number of surgical instruments, prepared certain drug mixtures, and arranged water, towels, and all the accessories of a tedious surgical operation. Suddenly he burst into laughter. Poor fool, he exclaimed, paid me five thousand dollars to kill him didn't have the courage to snuff his own candle. Singular, singular, the queer freaks these madmen have. You thought you were dying, poor idiot. Allow me to inform you, sir, that you are as much alive at this moment as ever you were in your life. But it will be all the same to you. You shall never be more conscious than you are now, and for all practical purposes, so far as they concern you, you are dead henceforth though you shall live. By the way, how should you feel without a head? Ha, ha, ha! But that's a sorry joke. He lifted the unconscious form from the lounge and laid it upon the operating table. About three years afterwards, the following conversation was held between a captain of police and a detective. She may be insane, suggested the captain. I think she is. And yet you credit her story? I do. Singular. Not at all. I myself have learned something. What? Much in one sense, little in another. You have heard those queer stories of her husband. Well, they are all nonsensical, probably with one exception. He is generally a harmless old fellow, but peculiar. He has performed some wonderful surgical operations. The people in his neighborhood are ignorant, and they fear him and wish to be rid of him. 
hence they tell a great many lies about him and they come to believe their own stories the one important thing that i have learned is that he is almost insanely enthusiastic on the subject of surgery especially experimental surgery and with an enthusiast there is hardly such a thing as a scruple it is this that gives me confidence in the woman's story you say she appeared to be frightened doubly so first she feared that her husband would learn of her betrayal of him second the discovery itself had terrified her but a report of this discovery is very vague argued the captain he conceals everything from her she is merely guessing in part yes in another part no she heard the sounds distinctly though she did not see clearly horror closed her eyes what she thinks she saw is i admit preposterous but she undoubtedly saw something extremely frightful there are many peculiar little circumstances he has eaten with her but few times during the last three years and nearly always carries his food to his private rooms she says that he either consumes an enormous quantity throws much away or is feeding something that eats prodigiously he explains this to her by saying that he has animals with which he experiments this is not true again he always keeps the door to these rooms carefully locked and not only that but he has had the doors doubled and otherwise strengthened and has heavily barred a window that looks from one of the rooms upon a dead wall a few feet distance what does it mean asked the captain a prison for animals perhaps certainly not why because in the first place cages would have been better in the second place the security that he has provided is infinitely greater than that required for the confinement of ordinary animals all this is easily explained he has a violent lunatic under treatment i had thought of that but such is not the fact how do you know by reasoning thus he has always refused to treat cases of lunacy he confines himself to surgery the walls are not padded for the woman has heard sharp blows upon them no human strength however morbid could possibly require such resisting strength as has been provided he would not be likely to conceal a lunatic's confinement from the woman no lunatic could consume all the food that he provides so extremely violent mania as these precautions indicate could not continue three years if there is a lunatic in the case it is very probable that there should have been communication with someone outside concerning the patient and there has been none the woman has listened at the keyhole and has heard no human voice within and last we have heard the woman's vague description of what she saw you have destroyed every possible theory said the captain deeply interested and have suggested nothing new unfortunately i cannot but the truth may be very simple after all the old surgeon is so peculiar that i am prepared to discover something remarkable have you suspicions i have of what a crime the woman suspects it and betrays it certainly because it is so horrible that her humanity revolts so terrible that her whole nature demands of her that she hand over the criminal to the law so frightful that she is in mortal terror so awful that it has shaken her mind what do you propose to do asked the captain secure evidence i may need help you shall have all the men you require go ahead but be careful you are on dangerous ground you would be a mere plaything in the hands of that man two days afterwards the detective again sought the captain i have a queer document he said exhibiting torn fragments of paper on which there was writing the woman stole it and brought it to me she snatched a handful out of a book getting only a part of each of a few leaves 
These fragments, which the men arranged as best they could, were, the detective explained, torn by the surgeon's wife from the first volume of a number of manuscript books which her husband had written on one subject, the very one that was the cause of her excitement. About the time that he began a certain experiment three years ago, continued the detective, he removed everything from the suite of two rooms containing his study and his operating room. In one of the bookcases that he removed to a room across the passage was a drawer, which he kept locked, but which he opened from time to time. As is quite common with such pieces of furniture, the lock of the drawer is a very poor one, and so the woman, while making a thorough search yesterday, found a key on her bunch that fitted this lock. She opened the drawer, drew out the bottom book of a pile, so that its mutilation would more likely escape discovery, saw that it might contain a clue, and tore out a handful of the leaves. She had barely replaced the book, locked the drawer, and made her escape when her husband appeared. He hardly ever allows her to be out of his sight when she is in that part of the house. The fragments read as follows. The motory nerves. I had hardly dared to hope for such a result, although inductive reasoning had convinced me of its possibility, my only doubt having been on the score of my lack of skill. Their operation has been only slightly impaired, and even this would not have been the case had the operation been performed in infancy before the intellect had sought and obtained recognition as an essential part of the whole. Therefore I state, as a proved fact, that the cells of the motory nerves have inherent forces sufficient to the purposes of those nerves, but hardly so with the sensory nerves. These latter are, in fact, an offshoot of the former, evolved from them by natural, though not essential, heterogeneity, and to a certain extent are dependent on the evolution and expansion of a contemporaneous tendency that developed into mentality or mental function. Both of these latter tendencies, these evolvements, are merely refinements of the motory system, and not independent entities. That is to say, they are the blossoms of a plant that propagates from its roots. The motory system is the first, nor am I surprised that such prodigious muscular energy is developing. It promises yet to surpass the wildest dreams of human strength. I account for it thus. The powers of assimilation had reached their full development. They had formed the habit of doing a certain amount of work. They sent their products to all parts of the system. As a result of my operation, the consumption of these products was reduced fully one-half. That is to say, about one-half of the demand for them was withdrawn. But force of habit required the production to proceed. This production was strength vitality, energy. Thus, double the usual quantity of this strength, this energy, was stored in the remaining, developed a tendency that did surprise me. Nature no longer suffered the distraction of extraneous interferences, and at the same time being cut in two, as it were, with reference to this case, did not fully adjust herself to the new situation, as does a magnet which, when divided at the point of equilibrium, renews itself in its two fragments by investing each with opposite poles, but, on the contrary, being severed from laws that theretofore had controlled her, and possessing still that mysterious tendency to develop into something more potential and complex, she blindly, having lost her lantern, pushed her demands for material that would secure this development and as blindly used it when it was given her. Hence, this marvelous veracity, this insatiable hunger, this wonderful ravisness, and hence also, there being nothing but the physical part to receive this vast storing of energy, this strength that is becoming almost hourly Herculean, almost daily appalling. It is becoming a serious... Narrow escape today. By some means, while I was absent, it unscrewed the stopper of the silver feeding pipe 
which I have already herein termed the artificial mouth, and, in one of its curious antics, allowed all the chyle to escape from its stomach through the tube. Its hunger then became intense, I may say furious. I placed my hands upon it to push it into a chair, when, feeling my touch, it caught me, clasped me around the neck, and would have crushed me to death instantly had I not slipped from its powerful grasp. Thus I always had to be on my guard. I have provided the screw stopper with a spring catch, and usually docile when not hungry, slow and heavy in its movements, which are, of course, purely unconscious, any apparent excitement in movement being due to local irregularities of the blood supply of the cerebellum, which, if I did not have it enclosed in a silver case that is immovable, I should expose an the captain looked at the detective with a puzzled air. "'I don't understand it at all,' said he. "'Nor I,' agreed the detective. "'What do you propose to do?' "'Make a raid. Do you want a man?' Three, The strongest men in your district.' "'Why? The surgeon is old and weak.' "'Nevertheless, I want three strong men, and for that matter, Prudence really advises me to take twenty. At one o'clock the next morning, a cautious, scratching sound might have been heard in the ceiling of the surgeon's operating room. Shortly afterwards, the skylight sash was carefully raised and laid aside. A man peered into the opening. Nothing could be heard. That is singular, thought the detective. He cautiously lowered himself to the floor by a rope, and then stood for some moments listening intently. There was a dead silence. He shot the slide of a dark lantern and rapidly swept the room with the light. It was bare with the exception of a strong iron staple and ring, screwed to the floor in the center of the room with a heavy chain attached. The detective then turned his attention to the outer room. It was perfectly bare. He was deeply perplexed. Returning to the inner room, he called softly to the men to descend. While they were thus occupied, he re-entered the outer room and examined the door. A glance sufficed. It was kept closed by a spring attachment and was locked with a strong spring lock that could be drawn from the inside. The bird has just flown mused the detective. A singular accident. The discovery and proper use of this thumb bolt might not have happened once in fifty years if my theory is correct. By this time, the men were behind him. He noiselessly drew the spring bolt, opened the door, and looked out into the hall. He heard a peculiar sound. It was as though a gigantic lobster was floundering and scrambling in some distant part of the old house. Accompanying the sound was a loud, whistling breathing and frequent, rasping gasps. These sounds were heard by still another person, the surgeon's wife, for they originated very near her rooms, which were a considerable distance from her husband's. She had been sleeping lightly tortured by fear and harassed by frightful dreams the conspiracy into which she had recently entered for the destruction of her husband was a source of great anxiety she constantly suffered from the most gloomy forebodings and lived in an atmosphere of terror added to the natural horror of her situation were those countless sources of fear which a fright shaken mind creates and then magnifies she was, indeed, in a pitiable state, having been driven first by terror to desperation, and then to madness. Startled thus out of fitful slumber by the noise at her door, she sprang from her bed to the floor, every terror that lurked in her acutely tense mind and diseased imagination starting up and almost overwhelming her. The idea of flight one of the strongest of all instincts seized upon her, and she ran to the door, beyond all control of reason. She drew the bolt and flung the door wide open, 
and then fled wildly down the passage, the appalling hissing and rasping gurgle ringing in her ears apparently with a thousandfold intensity. But the passage was in absolute darkness, and she had not taken a half dozen steps when she tripped upon an unseen object on the floor. She fell headlong upon it, encountering in it a large, soft, warm substance that writhed and squirmed, and from which came the sounds that had awakened her. Instantly realizing her situation, she uttered a shriek such as only an unnameable terror can inspire, but hardly had her cry started the echoes in the empty corridor when it was suddenly stifled. Two prodigious arms had closed upon her and crushed the life out of her. The cry performed the office of directing the detective and his assistants, and it also aroused the old surgeon who occupied rooms between the officers and the object of their search. The cry of agony pierced him to the marrow, and a realization of the cause of it burst upon him with frightful force. It has come at last, he gasped, springing from his bed. Snatching from a table a dimly burning lamp and a long knife which he had kept at hand for three years, he dashed into the corridor. The four officers had already started forward, but when they saw him emerge they halted in silence. In that moment of stillness the surgeon paused to listen. He heard the hissing sound and the clumsy floundering of a bulky living object in the direction of his wife's apartments. It evidently was advancing towards him. A turn in the corridor shut out the view. He turned up the light which revealed a ghastly pallor in his face. Wife! he called. There was no response. He hurriedly advanced, the four men following quietly. He turned the angle of the corridor and ran so rapidly that by the time the officers had come in sight of him again, he was twenty steps away. He ran past a huge, shapeless object sprawling, crawling, and floundering along, and arrived at the body of his wife. He gave one horrified glance at her face and staggered away. Then a fury seized him. Clutching the knife firmly and holding the lamp aloft, he sprang toward the ungainly object in the corridor. It was then that the officers, still advancing cautiously, saw a little more clearly though still indistinctly, the object of the surgeon's fury and the cause of the look of unutterable anguish in his face. The hideous sight caused them to pause. They saw what appeared to be a man, yet evidently was not a man. Huge, awkward, shapeless, a squirming, lurching, stumbling mass, completely naked. It raised its broad shoulders. It had no head, but instead of it, a small metallic ball surmounting its massive neck. Devil! claimed the surgeon, raising the knife. Hold there! commanded a stern voice. The surgeon quickly raised his eyes and saw the four officers, and for a moment fear paralyzed his arm. The police! he gasped. Then, with a look of redoubled fury, he sent the knife to the hilt into the squirming mass before him. The wounded monster sprang to its feet and wildly threw its arms about, meanwhile emitting fearful sounds from a silver tube through which it breathed. The surgeon aimed another blow, but never gave it. In his blind fury he lost his caution and was caught in an iron grasp. The struggling threw the lamp some feet toward the officers, and it fell to the floor, shattered to pieces. Simultaneously with the crash the oil took fire, and the corridor was filled with flame. The officers could not approach. Beyond them was the spreading blaze, and secure behind it were two forms struggling in a fearful embrace. They heard cries and gasps, and saw the gleaming of a knife. The wood in the house was old and dry. It took fire at once, and the flames spread with great rapidity. The four officers turned and fled, barely escaping with their lives. In an hour, nothing remained of the mysterious old house and its inmates 
but a blackened ruin. End of the Monster Maker Recording by Jeff Chestnut